Nephi is done, and yet he isn't done, right? Chapter 31 ends with the amen, but then there's a, a coda. There's a final echo. There's still two more chapters here. And I always get the sense in 32, the way he begins it, that Nephi uh, almost laments the fact that he has to keep going here. I, I really did drop the mic for a reason. I gave the amen because I was done. How do you beat the grand finale of this is the way, there's no other way, this is the name, follow Jesus. Okay, you got the doctrine, and that'll help you for the rest of your journey. You're hand in hand with him. So if this was Nephite General Conference, I really do picture the prophet Nephi ending his final discourse on the, Saturday, the Sunday afternoon session. It's done, we know that, okay? He's given the final amen, and then he walks away from the stand. The podium starts to descend. You hear the organ start to play the music for the final concluding hymn from the Tabernacle Choir. After that, we're going to have the closing prayer and we're done. Okay, it's over. And yet, it's as if Nephi looks out as he's gotten back into his big red chair. And he looks out across the conference center as the lights start to come back up. And he sees all the gathered saints staring at him with a look of confusion slash concern on their eyes, with their hands like cocked and half raised like they have a question. And, and the Nephi is looking like, what? No, I'm done. We're, we're, we're finished. I told you everything you need to know. It's, it's, go back and reread the fourth article of faith. Okay? It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's repentance, it's baptism, it's Holy Ghost. Oh, and it's endure to the end. Make sure you do that. But it's that one that we're all worried about. It's, that's the, the source of the concern. It's like, yeah, um, I went through the first four principles and ordinances by the time I was eight years old, and that was over 40 years ago for me. Uh, that fifth step is the long one. And I got some questions about that. I joke with my young adults, uh, my students at BYU, especially the return missionaries, that the church is a well-oiled machine up until you come home from your mission. I mean, in terms of programmatic help. Like, we got a, this is what you do when you're 12, and this is when you're 14, and then you're 16, and then you're 18, and these are the agents, and then we have all these programs, and, and sometimes we get beads and badges, and sometimes we get ribbons and, and bookmarks, and, and it's like, here's all these boxes to check, and these things that you do, and this is the program, this is the path. And then we get home from our missions, and it's like, ah, welcome home. And you're like, awesome, what's my next step? And they say, endure to the end. And you're all, huh? Uh, that, that like lasts a long time. It's like, yeah, till the end. Just endure. Like, uh, is there like a program I'm supposed to follow? Is there a, a handbook, a pamphlet, uh, some boxes to check? Please? Some goals you're going to set for me? Some clear instructions you're going to provide? <laughs> and the Lord's like, oh, no, I figured by now you've probably had enough of that. I'm like, no. Nah. Well, I'll admit, as a teenager, I felt like it sometimes. But I could really use some specific directions here. How do I find my companion, my eternal companion? What am I supposed to be when I grow up? Uh, how do I provide for my family? All these church callings I'm going to have, how, how do I do that? How do I stay faithful in this fifth step, this long stage post-confirmation? That is why Nephi is brought back to the podium in chapter 32. Reluctantly, it's like he goes back up. You see all of a sudden the podium starts to raise again and, the, and Nephi comes back, turns around and kind of closes off the, the opening notes of the final hymn from the Tabernacle Choir, turns back and begins to speak yet again in chapter 32. And says in verse 1, Now behold, my beloved brethren, I still love you. I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered in by the way. And yep, you nailed it, Nephi. That's what's on all our minds. How do I navigate the eternal endurance that you described at the end of your discourse? 
Everything else seems pretty clear. But endure to the end, that's a tricky one. No, but notice Nephi's answer. But behold, why do ye ponder these things in your hearts? To which I want to say, wait, really? You're wondering why we're wondering? Man, I guess you've got life figured out way better than we do. I've got so many questions. Uh, I'm so grateful for all that you've laid out, but I've got a long journey ahead of me, and I don't know all the... I know you said that it was straight and narrow, and it was light, it lays in a direct path before him. Unfortunately, my path is a little more, winder, more winding. I tend to wander on occasion, and sometimes I'm sure I'll feel lost, and I need to know how to get back on track. So, a little help, Nephi? Please? You glory in plainness. I'd love some plain instruction here. Well, verse 2 and 3. Notice what Nephi is going to tell us. Actually, the, the whole rest of this very short chapter is going to try to respond to that question. What do I do during the endure to the end stage? It's like when Joseph Smith says, well, I just teach correct principles and let them govern themselves. And we're sometimes like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm ready for self-governance. I'm not sure if I'm ready for general principles, in fact. I'd rather have specific instructions. This is why in the letters of Paul, especially the letter to the Galatians, People that were enjoying the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ didn't have as much enjoyment as they thought they would because they missed the strictness and clarity, the plainness of the law of Moses. Yeah, there were a lot of boxes to check, but at least I knew which ones I needed to check, that needed to check in. Now this freedom, I got so much rope, I'm tangling myself up and tripping over it. So what do I do? And for the rest of this chapter, Nephi is going to answer that. Here's his first answer, verse 2 and 3. Do ye not remember that I said unto you that after ye had received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? Remember that line? That was, that was, well, it's not just a line. Remember that promise I made back in chapter 31? Now, how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Because angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Those two are kind of hand in hand. Wherefore, Nephi says, they speak the words of Christ, and wherefore, he goes on, I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. And that's the first answer Nephi is going to give. What do we do? I'll put it this way. All of chapter 32 is trying to answer the question, how do I endure to the end? How do I know what to do when I've already worked my way down through the fourth article of faith? Uh, is there an instruction manual for this? And the answer is, well, yes and no. How do you navigate life wisely? Number one, you feast upon the words of Christ because the words of Christ will tell you all things that you should do. That's the tongue of angels. That's, that's the word of God. Angels aren't going to be telling you stuff that they're making up. They are messengers from heaven, and so it's heaven's message that they're delivering. Think about what the angel Moroni did for Joseph Smith that night in 1823. He quoted scripture all night. Here's some Acts. Here's some Isaiah. Here's some, you understand? Here's, here's some, some, uh, some Joel. Hugh Nibley used to joke that, like, why do people want angels to come? All angels ever seem to do is quote scripture to you. And since you already got scripture, you might as well just eliminate the middleman and jump back into the scriptures themselves. Oh, good point. So if, if you're going to have the tongue of angels, you're going to be quoting scripture. You're going to be, you're going to know God's word well enough that you've internalized it, made that word your own. And when you speak, it's as if angels were speaking. It's as if Christ were speaking. Because it's his words you are teaching people. Hmm. And those words, how oh, they'll teach you everything you need. Again, I can see why my professor inserted the word by. How do I endure to the end? Well, by feasting upon the words of Christ. How do I stay faithful? How do I stay unshaken? Oh, I keep my hand on the rod. Hand or hand the rod along. I come to God through his word. And his word tells me everything I need to know. Now, I love this verse, but I do want to kind of push back against Nephi for a moment and just ask, really? 
I mean, I love the concept, but are you, is that just hyperbole? Like, hey, scripture study is really good. It's helpful. It brings the spirit. And, is, and that's good. But do, do the scriptures really answer every question? I've sometimes done this with my students. Uh, let's say you're a parent of teenagers now. And you were teenagers pretty, you know, pretty recently. So you know what a, what a challenge that can be. Uh, how do you raise teenagers? Real quick, go to the topical guide and look up teenagers and tell me what verses uh, it lists. Because that's how you write your talks, right? You just go to the, you can kind of short cut, go to the top of the guide, look up some verses and kind of cherry pick them, and then just string them together into a talk and then tell some stories and stuff and you're good to go. Well, let's say you're giving a talk on raising teenagers and write your talk right now. Go to the top of the guide. They go there, they th thumb through, they find the T section, they go to T E E, and there's nothing there. Nothing under teenagers. Hmm. Oh, so a Nephi, I guess the words of Christ don't quite tell me everything. They don't talk about raising teens. And he just kind of looks at me. I actually had an experience once, I've mentioned this before, when a set of parents came to talk to me about an adult son of theirs who was contemplating transitioning gender and leaving his wife and his children uh, so that he could step into a gender identity that was not his at birth. And they were just wondering how on earth, this is an adult child, so it's not just someone at home that I, I've got like no control, what do I do? And I remember like desperate, I don't know how to counsel this couple. I don't know how to help them through this, this, this question. And then I got Nephi in the back of my mind saying, feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. And so mentally, what do I want to do? I want to rush through the topical guide, look up transgender in, in the topical guide, and see what it has to say. And guess what? Transgender isn't there. The T section is lamentably sparse on some really important topics. No teenagers, no transgender, what do I do? So Nephi, mm, I don't know if I can take you at your word. But actually, focus on his word. Feast. Feast upon the words of Christ. Because if you can do that correctly, oh, they'll tell you everything you need to know. Now, I remember once wrestling with all the verbs in Scripture that talk about what to do with Scripture. To read, to study, to ponder, to pray, to search, to, f to, to treasure up. That's a great one. But feast was one of my absolute favorites. Only Nephi uses it. And what does it mean to really feast on this? And then I had some fun with an acronym. Trying to kind of, what, how, what, how do I feast? How do I teach my students to feast? And I took an F-E-A-S-T and spelled it out this way. To me, it's the simplest way to organize a family home evening lesson or a church talk or a lesson. F stands for find principles, because it's principles that can respond to every individual circumstance. It's principles that allow you to speak with the tongue of angels and know all that ye must do in any given circumstance. It's teaching correct principles that allows you to govern yourself. Well, it's knowing those correct principles, okay? Back to Joseph's state, uh, statement. Because a principle applies across time and through space and all kinds of different situations. The principle is how you boil it down to its bare essential. Elder Richard G. Scott defined principles as concentrated truths packaged for application. He described it almost like as a diamond in the rough. And the rough, the rock that it's embedded in, that's all the historical detail. Oh, somehow you're going to have to pay the price to to dislodge the principle, that diamond, from the surrounding historical detail, to get it down to concentrated form. It's not about Nephi building a ship. It's about some, a disciple having to do something difficult because God commanded us to do it. But then God providing the plans and the means and us working to develop the tools. Ah, I get it now. I'm not talking about Nephi and ships anymore. I'm talking about me in any difficult circumstance. 
You with me? Con take the truth and concentrate it down to its essence. Package it in, kind, in the kind of language that makes it applicable in a lot of different circumstances. That's a principle. It's like story problems in math class. They're harder because you're not sure which formula to use. But once you can separate out the detail of the story in the story problem, you can usually concentrate it down to, ah, this is just a geometry, a ge geometry problem, and I'm trying to find the length of the hypotenuse of the triangle. That's it. I can do this. I know how to do that. You with me? So I'm looking for principles. That's the F in feast. Find the principle in the scriptural story you're studying. The E stands for, in my, in my acronym, explain it. Because if you can't explain it, you still don't really, you haven't really captured the principle. You haven't packaged it in an applicable form. So explain it. You're looking at a verse of scripture and you're thinking, I think there's something beyond surface level. If I got rid of historical detail, what is he really teaching here? Oh, there's a principle there. Great. Explain it. Okay. En encapsulate it. What would you write in the margin that applies to this story and to so many others? Okay. So F, find the principle. E, explain it in your own words. A, apply it. Now, how do I apply it to my circumstance? I saw how it fit them there then. How does it fit me here now? Remember, it's a concentrated truth packaged for application. So the A of feast stands for apply. Then S and T, if I'm teaching this to someone else and I found the principle, I've explained it, I can apply it in my situation or in theirs, then all I've got left to do is S, share examples and experiences that other people have had living that principle. So they know it is livable. They know that it works. They see how it functions. Share those things. I, this principle I found that I've explained to you, it, it applies in my life. In fact, it already has. Let me share the examples and, and stories that I've got that illustrate it. And now that you've seen it applied in real life with all these real stories, then T, I can testify that I know that principle is true because I've lived it. It got me through those things. The principles that I've learned from Lehi raising <laughs> Laman and Lemuel and Nephi and Sam and Jacob and Joseph, the, the principles I've learned from Lehi and Sariah have helped me raise teenagers, even though teenagers aren't in the top of the head. And when I was trying to counsel that couple about a potentially transgender child, I just prayed, Heavenly Father, Please assemble my cloud of witnesses. That's the language of, Revel of uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Please assemble my cloud of scriptural witnesses. I need every Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Old Testament, New Testament, Pearl Great Price figure I've ever met to come together so I can ask them, what do I do in this situation? I trust Nephi. The words of Christ will tell me all things I should do if I learn how to feast upon them. Their story won't tell it, but their principle will, once I see the application. So, cloud of witnesses, come together. Here's the, here's the situation for this wonderful couple. What would you do? And, they're all, and I look out at them, spiritually speaking, metaphorically, and they're scratching their head going, I don't even know what you're talking about. I try, I try to explain it. This is what's going on. And then I just wait. I pray for the Spirit to translate scriptural language into my own language to accommodate past into present, to speak plainly according to my understanding, that my language, that I can get it, okay? And as I pondered that, be patient. But in that situation, the prophet Samuel eventually raised his hand and told me about the time when Israel wanted a king so they could be like all the other nations. And how did God tell Samuel to navigate that? I started seeing things in that story in the book of Samuel that applied to this couple's situation far beyond anything I'd ever learned before when I just read Samuel directly. I was blown away at how many principles came to the surface that we could then separate from surrounding historical material, polish that diamond, in the, to take it from the rough, and present it to this wonderful couple to give them insight, hope, 
ideas of what to do moving forward. It was an amazing experience. I wasn't in the topical guide, but it was in the words of Christ once we learned how to feast upon them. I, I hope this is making sense. To me, it's exhilarating. To me, scripture study, the purpose of scripture study, among other things, is to stockpile principles that can be applied in real life situations. Just stockpile them and then wait for the moment when the Spirit says, oh, that's the story they're living right now. Okay? I actually had a really study president years ago, very early on in my career. When I didn't have as much experience with Scripture, but I still had the same faith in Scripture. And this release study president said, would you come and do a fireside to the sisters in our ward? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it. What's the topic? And she said, time management. And I was like, yeah, really? Time management? She's like, yeah, that's, we really feel strongly that's what the sisters are going to need. All the balls in the air and the juggling that they have to do as young mothers. And I'm like, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. But a fireside on time management? Well, I mustered my courage. And I said to this wonderful release study president, I'll tell you what. Full disclosure, I've never read any books on time management. Uh, I don't know the seven habits of a time manager. I've never seen uh, chicken soup for the time manager's soul. I, I, don't, I don't know the, the worldly wisdom on time management. But I do love the scriptures. And if you'll allow me to teach time management principles from the scriptures and the words of living prophets, then I'll do it. And she was like, Really? You can do that? There's stuff about time management in the scriptures? And inside I'm going, there better be. <laughs> I don't know what they are, but, but it was Nephi. Feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you must do. And I took, it, I took his word for it. And she was like, sounds awesome. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And then it's like, okay, Nephi, you better back me up on this. And as I assembled my cloud of witnesses and started asking them for principles about time management, amazing insights started to come, which I ended up teaching at this Relief Society fireside. Okay, so remember, chapter 32 is Nephi walking us through every help that we need to navigate enduring to the end. Okay, whatever your specific situation might entail, how do I navigate it? Number one. Feast upon the words of Christ. Okay, Find the principles, study the word, and the word will get you home. The iron rod stretches the whole way through. Okay, Leahona as well. That's a little harder. The words will change, the spindles will move, but also the word of God is like the Leahona. You've got to learn to navigate life with it. Okay, It's going to be dependent on your faith and your diligence and your heed. So yeah, grow up a bit and graduate from just the, the simplicity of the iron rod to the complexity of the liahona and master both means of, of direction and divine communication. With that then, let's move forward to the next clue that Nephi gives us in verse 4 and 5. Wherefore now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock, Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. Think about how often elsewhere in Scripture it talks about asking and seeking and knocking. In fact, take that as an acronym, and you just spelled out ask. It doesn't get any clearer than that, right? Ask, seek, knock. Strive for the light, because if you don't have it, then of course you're going to be walking in darkness, stumbling around, wondering how to move forward along the path. Okay? Ask. For behold, again I say unto you, that if ye will enter in by the way, which is what chapter 31 was all about, right? Start the path, come into Christ. And if you'll receive the Holy Ghost, which is the fourth step in the fourth article of faith, well, guess what? It, the Holy Ghost, will show unto you all things what ye should do. And that's the second clue. In the previous clue, it was the word of Christ will tell you all that you should do. Here, it's the Holy Ghost that will show you all that you can do, or all that you should do. And I wonder about the difference between the telling and the showing. I think that's kind of cool. The Spirit has a way of opening the eyes of our understanding, helping us see the results of this decision if I go down that path versus the results of this one if I go down this one instead. The Holy Ghost opens our eyes. It shines the light if we'll simply ask and seek and knock. 
That's how I'm... You understand what Nephi is doing here? Confused on how to live life? Study the scriptures and feast upon the words of Christ. And the tongue of angels will tell you everything. And seek the Spirit. The Spirit is what's going to translate past into present. The Spirit's going to help you see how principles apply. The Spirit will show you how this fits in your life. And how to move forward from this moment. We cannot afford to underestimate the importance of the Holy Ghost as we strive to endure to the end. I think it was Elder Holland who said, I'm a general authority, so I teach general principles. If you need specific instruction, you better go to the specific authority, and that's the Holy Ghost. I, I love the, the division of labor there, that general authorities are giving us the general principles, but it's got to be the Holy Ghost that spe specifies the specific way that principle applies in my life, in this situation. I've got to grow up in God and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. It's not always going to be crystal clear. It's not going to be spelled out before me. So no wonder Leahona requires diligence, faith, and heed. You, you with me on this? There was a talk that Elder Packer gave in a general authority training meeting back in 2000. And Von J. Featherstone of the Quorum of the Seventy was there. One of his final training meetings before he was made an emeritus member of the Seventy. He'd learned from, from apostles and prophets for 30 years. And yet he said that training from President Packer was the most life-changing training he'd ever received. And it was all about the Holy Ghost. Where President Packer had reread. Jesus the Christ and Life of Christ by Frederick Farrar and Fox's Book of Martyrs. Interesting way to prepare for a training. He'd read read the standard works, focusing on everything he could find about the Holy Ghost. And after that level of preparation, President Packer boiled it all down to this essential message. We have to teach the members of the church to live worthy of the Holy Ghost 24-7 for the rest of their lives. When I first heard that from Elder Featherstone, I thought, President Packer, you could have said that without all that reading, without all that preparation. And he could have. But the point is, it was after all that preparation, where he would paid a price where God could have told him anything. But that's what God told him. We need the Spirit more than anything else. Yeah, how else are we going to navigate the endure to the end stage? How else are we going to have enough brightness of hope to shine ahead on our journey through the darkness? Think about what President Nelson has said more recently. That we're not going to survive spiritually without the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. His guidance, His clarification, His confirmation, no wonder the last thing we get before we're told to endure to the end is the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how we navigate it. Okay, So study the scriptures. Keep the spirit. That's the, that's, there's the armor of God. Yeah, yes, I'm huddled behind my shield of faith, but what sword am I sharpening? The sword of the spirit and the word. That's how I cut through the brambles of life. That's how I move forward in faith. From there, verse 6. Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. There he's repeating what he said at the end of chapter 31, right? This is the doctrine. That's it. You got the Holy Ghost. He's the one that's going to help you through the enduring to the end stage. But notice what he said at the end there. There's not going to be anything else until... And then you're like, ooh, wait a minute. Might there be more coming beyond the... What we have right now in terms of faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, endure to the end. What other doctrine might there be? Well, Nephi says, it's, there's no more doctrine until after he manifests himself unto you in the flesh. Remember, post-resurrection ministry is going to include a trip to his other sheep. And Nephi here says, when he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh, the things which he shall say unto you shall ye observe to do. Mm, there's the ultimate source of instruction. We've seen the importance of the scriptures. We've seen the importance of the Spirit. Well, here we're seeing the importance of the Savior Himself. 
Remember in 3 Nephi 15, when they're confused, what do we do about the law of Moses? And he says, I'm, I am the law of Moses. I'm the law giver. So follow me. If you've been following the law, you've been following me. Now let's follow the law giver, and I'm going to help you through the next stage. To think about the changes that President Nelson has made recently. And whatever changes might yet be ahead, in a church led by ongoing revelation. Imagine the second coming when Jesus himself descends and I'll take anything he has to say. Oh, if I can endure to that end, and then how do I endure through the millennium? I want to hang on every word Jesus has to give me. To live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of the Son of God. Okay? So we've got scriptures, We've got spirit, we've got Savior himself, and then there's one last thing. Verse 7, now I, Nephi, cannot say more, okay, that this is it. I, I tried to finish at the end of chapter 31. Now I really am finishing here. I cannot say more. The spirit stoppeth mine utterance. Remember when he stopped me back in 1 Nephi 14, and I wanted to explain the end of the world in my plain prophecies. And he said, nope, we're going to leave that to John the Beloved so he can wrap it all up in mystery and symbolism. So people really have to wrestle with this stuff. <laughs> okay. It's like, no, I don't want everything crystal clear because otherwise they never grow up and learn how to figure things out on their own. So Nephi, with all of your glorious gift of plainness, nope, zip the lip, stop your utterance. And with that, Nephi says this, I'm left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men, for they will not search knowledge, nor understand great knowledge, even when it's given unto them in plainness, even as plain as word can be, which, remember, is Nephi's gift. Nephi, it's, I, I feel his pain here. I wish I could keep going. I wish I could spell it all out, but even sometimes spelling it out doesn't change people. That's why he relied on Isaiah so much. I have the clarity of prose, but he has the persuasive power of poetry and symbolism. I just hope you're willing to pay the price to wrestle with, what, with his words. Because if you are unbelieving, you won't have the faith to endure the process. If you are wicked, then you're... You're going to succumb to sin and not even want to know the truth. If ignorance is your problem, you're going to be trapped without the truth that would make you free. And if stiff-neckedness is your problem, you won't bow your head in humility. You won't look up to God in faith. You won't ask. I'm fascinated by those four obstacles that he's lamenting over that are keeping us from searching for truth, for being willing to learn from the Lord. If you feel like you are stagnating or plateauing in this endure to the end stage, you feel like answers aren't coming, your scripture study is not providing you direction and, your, and the spirit seems to be less than what it could be in your life, then just take this self-assessment to what degree am I struggling with unbelief or wickedness or ignorance or stiff-neckedness? Because if, if those things would get in the way of plainness, they're certainly going to get in the way of complexity. Okay? We've got to get past all that. Those are the obstacles we have to overcome. And one of the ways we do that, look at how he ends this chapter. This is his final piece of advice. You've got scripture, you've got spirit, you've got savior. You've got to overcome these obstacles to access the truth that they can provide. And how do we do it? Verse 8 and 9. Now, my beloved brethren, I perceive that ye ponder still in your hearts. Just like you were at the beginning of this chapter. It's the whole reason I had to come back to the podium. And it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. It's like we're still holding on to Nephi's leg, like scared to let him go. 
This is like missionaries afraid to leave their families or new converts afraid that the missionary, their missionary is about to get transferred. These are young couples afraid to launch out on their own. This is us afraid to accept new callings it's, or, or move into a new chapter in life. It's any of these moments where it's like, no, 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 you can't leave. I don't know how to do this without you. And Nephi's like, come on, I've got to go. This is like Jesus saying to his apostles, how long will I be with you? Oh, ye of little faith, you have to be able to do this without me, me physically present. And so what's Nephi tell us through his grief? How do, we, how do we navigate it without his direct, plain help? His final conclusion, if ye would hearken unto the Spirit, which teacheth a man to pray, ye would know that ye must pray. That's it. For the evil spirit teacheth not a man to pray, but teacheth him that he must not pray. Prayer really is the answer. Pray over the scriptures and you'll be able to see their principles. Pray for the spirit to increase in your life. Pray for clarification of what the spirit is showing you. Throughout the whole process, pray for direction. Pray to know what to do. Keep the communication lines open. It doesn't just have to be written. You can talk to God. Eliminate the middlemen. Ask God. Seek. Knock. That's what prayer is for. And so, behold, I say unto you that ye must pray always and not faint, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ. And pray for what? that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. I love the way Nephi ends chapter 32. The whole chapter is an absolute gem because it's what is going to help us navigate the rest of our lives. And he concludes with prayer. Don't do anything without prayer. Pray always. Don't faint whether it's a vocal prayer, a silent prayer, or simply a prayer in your heart as you're striving to always remember Jesus. If, if you'll always stay open to whatever the Spirit directs, to can just begin your day by opening, by, by dialing God's number and then just kind of leaving it on speakerphone the rest of the day. It's like I see my students all the time now, just walking around campus. They always have their earbuds in. And half the time they say something, you think they're talking to you. It's like, oh, they're, they're actually on a phone call. Sorry, sorry. But, well, imagine having the spiritual earbud in constantly and God's always on the other line. And before I do anything, this is, this is beyond just, oh, I guess this is the verse that says why we have to have an opening prayer. And why we're supposed to have a blessing on the food. No, it's more than that. Anytime you're about to do anything, any performance, consecrate that performance through prayer. Let the Lord know, Heavenly Father, I'm about to study my scriptures. And some days my brain is so distracted that it feels like I'm doing eye calisthenics and my eyes are going back and forth across the page, but nothing's entering my brain or my heart. And I've got to get something more out of it than that. So please be with me. Please calm down my ADHD mind. We all have, society has kind of given all, all, all of us that, right? Easily distracted. Please help me see principles come off the page. Help me have the wisdom to turn aside and see burning bushes whenever they appear. Help me know what to write down in the margin or on the fleshy tables of the heart. I, I, I do this all the time and I don't get much out of it. I got to start getting more out of it than I do. So I am going to consecrate this performance for the welfare of my soul. Please let it do something for me. Heavenly Father, I'm about to go to Sunday school or to Relief Society or Elders Quorum. I'm about to go to church and sometimes I just endure it Help me gain from it instead. Please, I'm consecrating this next two hours.
May it be for the welfare of my soul. I even wonder if prayer needs to start with an opening prayer. <laughs> uh, where it's like, Heavenly Father, I'm about to pray. I know technically I am right now, but I'm about to really pray. And sometimes my prayers are pretty weak. We both know that. Sometimes my prayers are like spit wads that hit the ceiling and don't rise any higher. Sometimes I'm just saying a prayer instead of lifting my voice high that it reaches the heavens. So as I'm about to start really praying, will you help me really connect? It's got to be for the welfare of my soul. Otherwise, I will be putting wages into a bag with holes. Remember Haggai? And maybe our preliminary prayers should always be, Heavenly Father, please, in what I'm about to do or about to experience, please help me sew up my bag so I'll have something spiritual to show for it when all is said and done. I pray before I ever hit record on these lessons. And I plead with Heavenly Father, please let this lesson be for, be for the welfare of thy children's souls. I pray that prayer is answered. I pray that it helps me. I pray that it helps you. Because we've got a long journey ahead as we endure to the end. Will you pray? Will you cry unto the Father in the name of the Son? Everything you do, will you consecrate so that it can make a difference in your life? We Latter-day Saints do a lot. I worry that we don't always get a lot out of it. And maybe it's because we're not consecrating those performances. Let it count. And with that, Nephi really can say goodbye with one last chapter. I mean, I'm already here. I'm at the podium. Uh, you interrupted my ending already uh, and drew, drew me back. So while I'm here, can I just express a few final words of testimony, of faith, of love to all of you? And that's what chapter 33 gives us. It is a beautiful last lecture, a dying man's words. He says in verse 1 and 2, Now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people. Can you get a sense he's saying goodbye here? Like this is it. There could have been so much more. We could have had third and fourth Nephi at the beginning, not just at the end of this book. Oh, hundredth part. But then again, I'm not that good of a writer anyway. Really? You kind of blew me away for the last, what, we've got 55 chapters by now in first and second Nephi. But that's what he admits. Neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. Oh, for when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, ah, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. Man, that makes me wish I could listen to Nephi and not just read him. Because I would say, Nephi, no, you're mighty in writing. You're incredible. But if your speech is even stronger than that, man, let me hear. There's a difference between oral and, and, and literary, between the spoken and the written word. I've read some interesting stuff on that from an academic perspective. And even things like sound is immersive. It can come from all directions and you're, it's all just kind of the, the, the sound waves hitting the ear and no wonder music can be so, such an immersive experience. Whereas sight, your vision, yeah, you got some peripheral vision, but I have to focus on something. And so it's got to come at me from a particular angle. And so hearing somebody speak versus reading their written words, those are two very different things. Now, the nice thing about writing, as Isaiah learned, right, you, if you write it, then the words can outlive the initial audience, right? And if the initial audience doesn't have eyes to see or ears to hear, then, yeah, we'll have to preserve these somehow on plates or on pages. And so we have the written word. And that'll have to su suffice, Nephi says. Uh, but the sound of, and, and the, the, I'll put it this way, the experience of hearing things. Have you ever listened to a general conference talk that changed you? And then you read it and you're like, why was that so life-changing? Because it's, 
we were in the moment and you were with the person and the sound of the voice and the inflection and the power of the spirit in that very moment, let giving you something beyond what you're going to be able to see on a, on a written page. I'll put it this way. That maybe there's a contrary here between the, the written and the heard. Maybe there's, a, a, there's things that one can do that the, that the other can't and vice versa. So we need both. I am grateful for what Nephi wrote, but man, if the Holy Ghost conveys mm, the, the, the moment, the emotion, the power, I even love the way he said it, it brings it unto the hearts of the children of men. Elder Bednar paused on that preposition and said, notice it doesn't necessarily bring it into the heart because our hearts might be closed. But the Spirit can at least bring it unto, and then the choice is ours. Will we open our heart and let that truth in? I hope so. But then the next verse, But behold, Nephi says, there are many that harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit. So yeah, they close the door. It's just unto, and it never gets into. So no wonder it's got to be written, because then that way they can change. The words can stay the same. But maybe the person will change after time. Their hearts will soften. And then the word can now enter with the help of the Holy Ghost. But no. In the meantime, there are those who harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit, that it hath no place in them. Wherefore they cast many things away which are written, and esteem them as things of naught. This was a worry that Nephi mentioned way back in 1 Nephi chapter 19. Some people esteem the things of greatest worth to be worth less. And they trample underfoot the very God of Israel. Remember that powerful image that Nephi gave us there? Trampling God underfoot because we're trampling his words beneath us, paying them no heed. In some ways you get a sense here that Nephi is worried again. How will people react to my words? This book that will be eventually come forth, and the learned and the unlearned, and how are people going to respond to it? Remember 1 Nephi 5, my dad got the brass plates, studied them from the start, and knew they were of great worth. How will people respond to the gold plates that I've given them? Well, verse 3 and 4, I, Nephi, have written what I've written. That's it. That's all I've got. And I esteem it as of great worth, and especially unto my people. These are people who should see themselves in these words. You're just like him. These are the words of your forefathers. Learn from them. For I pray continually for them by day, Nephi says. And mine eyes water my pillow by night because of them. Remember, he has seen the future of his posterity. He knows what they will endure. Oh, this book someday has to come back to bless them. And he prays for that. He weeps for that. And I cry unto my God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. I know that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. I love that. Earlier, the end of the last chapter, he talked about consecrating his performance for the welfare of his soul. Let this mean something to me. But here he's using that same word, consecrate but it's for the welfare of someone else's soul. I almost wish there wasn't a chapter break there so we could just connect these words, these verses, that all of our efforts should be consecrated in two directions. May they bless me, but really may they bless others. That's why I'm casting this bread upon the waters. I want it to bless everyone that it touches. And Nephi's praying for that. He's consecrating his efforts for that. Please, Father, make it count. This book has to change lives. I do wonder, my friends, if we teach with enough desire, if we serve with enough focus that it's got to make a difference. I remember once years and years and years ago in a gospel doctrine class, I don't remember who taught it, thankfully, but they were in the middle of teaching something, some principle, some testimony, and the bell rang, so to speak. This is back in the day when they, you would ring the bell, and here's the end of Sunday school. And mid-sentence, they didn't even finish the 
thought, the principle, not even the sentence. As soon as the bell rang, they just said, oh, I guess we're out of time. Uh, and thanks for coming. And would you give the closing prayer? And I remember at the time going, what? Literally saved by the bell? You were just trying to fill the last hour? Hopes that you'd have enough stuff to say to make it to the end and then not a second, not a sentence beyond it. Really? I had a professor once years ago that asked us to write four page papers on topics of the Book of Mormon every week. It was an awesome, it was a master's class in the Book of Mormon. It was amazing. And every week we'd study a different subject and every week we had to write a four page paper on it. And it wasn't just, oh, fill the four pages with whatever you want. It was try to take everything the Book of Mormon says about faith and summarize it in four pages. Huh? It's like, oh yeah, this is going to be hard. It would be easier to write a 10 page paper on this. But take it all, the, the, the Book of Mormon's whole thing on the gathering of Israel and summarize it, condense it, package it in four pages. It was an exhilarating semester. Uh, it was intense. But I remember the professor saying, and when I say four pages, I want four pages. Not three and a half, not three and three quarters, not three and seven eighths. If you have a little bit of space where you can sneak in one more line about the, what the Book of Mormon teaches, then please strike a blow for the kingdom. That's how he always said it. I always got a kick out of that. Strike a blow for the kingdom. You've got a chance to teach and testify. You have a chance to lead or serve. Give it all you've got. I'm not asking for overzealousness, right? Don't run faster than you have strength, but whatever strength you have, give it the strength of your spirit, the power of your conviction. Consecrate things so they count. That's what Nephi is doing. I think that's what the Lord is asking of all of us. Imagine if all we did was with that consecrated intent. There's the tongue of angels. There's the power of God. Then Nephi says, verse 4 and 5, And the words which I have written in weakness shall be made strong unto them. That's exactly what Moroni learned in Ether 12. My words are too weak. He felt the same kind of weakness that Nephi did. I'm better, better at speaking than I am at writing. And the Gentiles are going to mock about this stuff. I mean, again, if you think about Nephi ending his ministry, Moroni ending his, they're both so book-based and they're so worried about their weakness. And yet they're both reminded, God takes weakness, and through his grace, he makes weak things strong. That's what Nephi's banking on. They will be made strong unto future readers, for it persuadeth them to do good. And I love that criteria. How do I know the Book of Mormon is true? Well, in so many ways, but one of them, it makes me want to be better. It makes me want to do good to those around me. Keep reading. It maketh known unto them of their fathers. Ooh, that was on the title page. It speaketh of Jesus and persuadeth them to believe in him. That's part of the title page purpose as well. Think about how does the Book of Mormon make you feel about the Savior? Does it persuade you to believe in him, to come unto him? Or the next phrase, and to endure to the end, which is life eternal? Does the Book of Mormon give you strength to carry on? Nephi prays that it will. Now he admits, it speaketh harshly against sin, according to the plainness of the truth. And Mr. Plainness, I just can't help it. Wherefore, no man will be angry at the words which I have written, save he shall be of the spirit of the devil. Now that's strong talk, and maybe he's getting flashbacks to his time with Laman and Lemuel. Remember what he said about to them back in 1 Nephi 16? The wicked take the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. But the righteous love it because it justifies them. They're trying to live these things. Okay, So I know there's some parts here that might be hard to, to hear. But remember, they're just wake-up calls. They're just cries to repent. And we all need to repent. Now verse 6, speaking of plainness, I glory in plainness. But it's not the only thing he glories in. And the rest of his list is even better. I glory in truth. In fact, I glory in my Jesus, for he hath redeemed my soul from hell. No wonder Nephi wrote so much about the things he gloried in. Plainness was his approach. 
but truth and Christian truth was his focal point. We speak of Christ and teach of Christ and prophesy of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. I glory in my Jesus. I love the possessive pronoun. Oh, he's mine. There are so many different actors who have depicted Jesus. Oh, uh, in Hollywood or in the church or... It, and it's interesting, that's a, that'd be a tough role to play. Because we all have this picture in our minds of what Jesus would really look like or be like or act like or make us feel like. And for some, it's like, yeah, no, I don't really like the actor. I mean, I did a good job portraying it. It was fine. But there was just something, I don't know, not, that's not my Jesus, is kind of how we often say it. And then we, we find one that just resonates with us. I love the Jesus of the Chosen, for example. It's like, oh, there's my Jesus. Approachable, loving, sense of humor. Oh, merciful, but just this amazing combination of things. This is real and welcoming, but also intimidating. And all, just the, the whole thing. Oh, there's my Jesus. Well, the real Jesus is the Jesus of all of us. And to let him become our own and then let him call us with possessive pronouns too. Those are my people. That's my covenant son or daughter. Oh, there's my Jared. He's still got some work to do. I'm still polishing some rough edges. But if my Jesus could claim me as his, the way I want to claim him as mine, there's covenant relationship. And Nephi has one. I glory in my Jesus. I know in whom I have trusted. So all of this is consecrated for my welfare, for others' welfare, for the glory of a God in whom I glory. And then he says that because of Jesus, verse 7 and 9, because I glory in him, because he saved me, I know he can save everyone else. And so I have charity for my people. And great faith in Christ that I shall meet many souls spotless at his judgment seat. Remember, God promised they wouldn't be cast off forever. It's a broken branch, but he's going to graft it back into the mother tree. So I have charity for them. I have faith in Christ on their behalf. Not only my people, but I have charity for the Jew. Let's expand it beyond the, the Lehite population and go to the whole house of Israel. I love them. I have charity for them. I, I mean, I say Jew because I mean them from whence I came. Those scattered will someday be gathered in. I have hope in Christ for them. And not only Nephites and Jews. Here's the bigger stretch. I also have charity for the Gentiles. The ones that will scoop up scattered Israel in their bosom, put them on their shoulders, and bring them triumphantly home. Now, at least the Gentiles that will come unto Christ, that will see themselves as a target audience of the covenant, and the only way they can come into it is by bringing the covenant back to the house of Israel. Otherwise, he says, Behold, for none of these can I hope, except they shall be reconciled unto Christ. Remember, reconciled was the word that Jacob used. We're, it's grace that saves us, but where works are trying to reconcile us. Nephi says the same thing. It's reconciliation that we're after. So we've got to work out the kinks. We've got to stop stiff-arming God, especially you Gentiles. You've got to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You've got to be reconciled unto Christ. You've got to enter into the narrow gate and walk in the straight path which leads to life and continue in the path until the end of the day of probation. There's the endure to the end he emphasized in chapter 31. Yeah, Gentiles, it's your only hope. The covenant was made with God's covenant people. And if you want to be part of that covenant, then please take on the covenant and then bring back the covenant to the house of Israel. As a Gentile myself, I'm so grateful I've been allowed in 
And you better believe I'm spending the rest of my life trying to extend that covenant invitation to everyone else that God intends to receive. Nephi then says in verse 10, Now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth. So now this is absolutely all-encompassing. Hearken unto these words, the Book of Mormon, and believe in Christ. Now that's a beautiful and, and hopefully we can do both. We're meant to. But if we have to choose one or the other, notice the next line. And I love that Nephi gets this. If ye believe not in these words, well, believe in Christ. Now he goes on. He can't help himself. If ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ. And he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. So yeah, I had to finish the thought. But if you pause right there when we're meant to, Nephi completely understands the difference between ends and means. And it's the ends that matter. It's the means that just get us there. And so what Nephi is saying there is, best case scenario, you, you accept the means for what they are, and those means bring you to the ends, which is Christ. Study the Book of Mormon, and it testifies of Jesus. It glories in him, as do I. But if, for whatever reason, your ignorance or your stiff-neckedness or your unbelief or your wickedness, all those obstacles he mentioned earlier, Maybe you're too learned. Maybe you think you're not learned enough. Maybe you think you have a Bible, a Bible, and you don't need any other Bible. For whatever reason, your eyes are closed or your ears are deaf or your heart is hard and you won't accept these words, so be it. But please accept Jesus. Please accept him. If because of my own weakness in writing, I somehow haven't been able to convey things in as powerful enough of, of a way for the Holy Ghost to bring these, brings these things into your hearts, then just find Jesus however you can, however you must. You've got to get to him. If you can arrive at that destination, then I'm fine with whatever means got you there. Whether it was Book of Mormon or some other book of Scripture some other road of life, you, get, you just got to find Him. So when I meet people that have left the church, what I really want to find out is, have you, left, have you left Jesus? Are you still searching for Him? Or have you given up on the whole journey? Are you still coming unto Him? Because if you come unto Him, it's all going to work out. Go back and reread section 84. If you pay attention to the Spirit, the Spirit, Spirit will bring you to the Father. The Father will bring you back into the covenant. That's where the church comes in. But that can wait. I just want you to find Jesus. I want you to find this loving Lord that just welcomes you with open arms. He'll work out the details of how that works with church membership and all that kind of stuff. He'll bring you back into a true understanding of the covenant. But He's the ends. All this other stuff is just means. You get it? I hope that we can... I hope we can love the Book of Mormon, but love it for its real intent, which was to love Jesus. Instead of getting so caught up about the book, the book, the book, no, oh, it's him, 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 not what, what, what. You get it? Again, if we know Jesus well enough, we're going to have no problem with the Book of Mormon because they're his words. He's the one that inspired them all. So Nephi kind of blurs those boundaries at the end, but, but I love that he distinguishes, distinguishes them enough to separate means and ends and know what this is all about. That's a key passage, especially for Latter-day Saints who may wonder about others who don't feel about the Book of Mormon the way they do. Nephi gets it. He's okay. okay? I've often said to my students, the Book of Mormon is incredibly self-aware but it is not self-absorbed. There's a difference. Self-aware, it knows itself, it knows its function, it knows its purpose, it knows its intent. It keeps talking about itself. The book, the book, the book, it's gonna... But it's not for the book's sake. It's not self-absorbed. It's not, hey, look at me, I'm the coolest book ever, and come, come read me. No, it's... Pointing, pointing, pointing to Jesus. So please come to me just so I can point you in the right direction. That's the difference. And I worry sometimes as members of the church, 
Are we not sufficiently self-aware? And are we too self-absorbed? Do we know what the church is for? Mere scaffolding to build the kingdom of God, the family of God. Are we too self-absorbed and look at what we do and what we have instead of self-aware that I'm just a means to a greater end and I'm trying to point you in the right direction? Nephi nails it, and I'm grateful for that. He can then say in verse 11 and 12, and with this he's almost finished, if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye. Joseph Smith said something similar about himself. If you don't believe I'm a prophet, fine. Uh, deep water is what I want to, to swim in. Uh, persecution has been my common lot for as long as I can remember. I'll let you be the judge of me. That's fine. Judge ye, Nephi says. But realize this. Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words. He'll do that at the last day if not earlier, if you don't give him a chance. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. This one I wish we could hear instead of just read, because I'd love to know Nephi's emotion. When I was younger and a little more fiery myself, I always pictured him kind of in your face, like, oh, you don't believe this? Well, just you wait, because someday you're going to know, and you and me, it's going to be mano a mano before the judgment bar, and yeah, you'll know that I was right. Yikes. Contentions of the devil. That's why I wanted to couple verse 11 with verse 12, because verse 12 is universal, or as near universal as Nephi can imagine it. I want everybody to make it, if not all, many, as many, as many as are willing to come. I want Judgment Day to be a glorious day for you. So I don't want your realization that Jesus is the Christ to only happen then. I want, it to re I want you to realize that early. This was Elder Maxwell's great talk, Why Not Now? When he said, if someday every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ, why not now? Why not bend the knee now when you're choosing to, instead of being compelled to when you're brought to your knees? Why not confess that Jesus is the Christ when it's still a matter of faith, instead of just an admission of the obvious? You understand that? So here what Nephi is saying is, someday you'll all know that Jesus is the Christ. Come to know that in advance, and it'll change your life in the meantime. Someday you'll know that the Book of Mormon is true because it was pointing to Jesus from start to finish. And if someday that's going to be obvious, because I'll be standing there, lamenting my own weakness, wishing I could have been more convincing and more persuasive, but I did the best that I could. I consecrated every effort. I prayed for you. I wept for you. I wrote for you. And I just wish I could have done it more powerfully. I'm sorry where I fell short. I'm sorry I don't have as much power and great glory as God himself, but now that you're with him, it's crystal clear. Believe me, I did my very best to convince you in advance through these otherwise weak words. Personally, I do look forward to meeting Nephi at the judgment bar. If nothing else, just to reassure him, your words were sufficiently powerful to me. Notwithstanding your weakness or mine, they taught me of Jesus. My Jesus. And I glory in him too. So with that, Nephi can end. And he does. Now, my beloved brethren, all those who are of the house of Israel, all ye ends of the earth, I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust. A little echo of Isaiah there. Nephi knew his role wants to couch it in those beautiful Old Testament kinds of terms. I'll be whispering to you. I'll be hissing forth. 
And what will I say? Farewell. Until that great day shall come. That great day of judgment. That great day when we finally come to know as we are known and see as we are seen. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God. We're back to the tree of life, right? Partaking of that fruit. You that want to stay in the great and spacious building. You that are wandering off in strange roads being lost. To you who won't partake, who won't respect the words of the Jews, there's the Bible, and also my words, there's the Book of Mormon, and the words which shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the Lamb of God. So anything else the Lord decides to teach you. Well, to you, behold, I bid you an everlasting farewell. In the previous verse, it was a temporary farewell until I see you at that glorious day of judgment. To those that won't be prepared for that day, well, it's not just a temporary farewell. It's an everlasting one. Because these words shall condemn you at the last day. For what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar. For thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. And then the real period, the real mic drop, the real end of general conference, the end of Second Nephi. It ends on quite the note of justice, doesn't it? And I again, again, I wonder if that is Nephi following the example of his hero, his scriptural hero, Isaiah. Because Isaiah, that was just in the first half and then mostly merciful in the second half, ends the book on a striking note. Just to Kind of bring us back. We're trying to correct the pendulum, not overcorrect things. So rather than just let it swing on eternally, let me just at the very end drop one last hint of justice to kind of a God forbid statement like Paul can give us. So yeah, these words are true. And I hope you're true to them. Otherwise, it's an everlasting farewell. This is what God has given me. It's what he's commanded me. And I Keep commandments. Remember, this is Nephi to a, to a T. He who focused on his own obedience so much, not because obedience brought life, he knew the deadness of the law, but it reconciled his will to the will of God. And by now, it's fully reconciled, as far as I can tell. And so, yes, I must obey. And so must we. Nephi, thank you. Thank you for your weakness as well as your strength for your imperfections as well as your near-perfect faith in Christ. I am grateful for your words and pray that we can fully live them. For the rest of our study this year, we're on to Jacob and to Enos and Jerem and Omni. We'll be going through the small plates and then exploding into the large plates with a larger-than-life history of God's people. Uh, it's an amazing book that lies ahead, but what a way to start it with Nephi's help. He was taught somewhat in all the learning of his father, Nephi was. And now we have been taught somewhat in all his learning. And I pray that it's been a blessing the way Nephi intended. With that, we have nothing left but to review some of his magnificent one-liners from the three chapters we've studied today. And then I'll turn you loose to rest and recover and then come back next week with one of my favorite books of Scripture, the book of Jacob. But here's a review. For my soul delighteth in plainness. He speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. How much more need have we, being unholy, Know ye not that he was holy? The straightness of the path, the narrowness of the gate. Follow me and do the things which ye have seen me do. Follow the Son with full purpose of heart. Speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. Endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God. I would ask if all is done. 
Ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him. Relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, a perfect brightness of hope. Press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ. Ye shall have eternal life. This is the way, and there is none other way. Feast upon the words of Christ. The words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. The Holy Ghost will show unto you all things what ye should do. This is the doctrine of Christ. I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. Ye must pray always and not faint. Consecrate thy performance, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. The power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. I cry unto my God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. The words which I have written in weakness will be made strong unto them. I glory in my Jesus. If you believe not in these words, believe in Christ. They teach all men that they should do good, notwithstanding my weakness. I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust. Thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Oh, my dear friends, what an amazing book of Scripture we've studied. What an amazing prophet to begin our journey through the pages of the Book of Mormon. I am grateful for Nephi's plainness. I'm grateful for his power. I'm willing to endure whatever weakness he may have exhibited and pray that, <laughs> that my weaknesses are endurable as well. But honestly, I think we can glory in what we've studied because of what Nephi glories in. He glories in our Jesus. And so do we.